Sure, the Sacramento Kings had one of the best offenses in NBA history, but as the playoffs showed, the Kings are still in need of another go-to primary score. Is Keegan Murray ready to make that step? The California Classic sure made it look like it's so. Let's talk about it right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off-season long. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News. And when I tell you I've been dying to talk about Keegan Murray over the past handful of days, I mean it. You know how big of a fan of Keegan Murray I am. If you don't, go back to not just multiple podcasts over the course of this past season, Go back to a little over a year ago when the Kings were uh, getting ready to make a selection with the fourth overall pick. I was pushing Keegan Murray from the beginning. Loved the idea of Keegan Murray from the beginning. Was one of many people who, of course, were excited that the Kings drafted uh, Keegan Murray on draft night. I'm a huge Keegan Murray supporter, so it shouldn't surprise you at all. Uh, the title of this episode or the things that I'm going to say in this episode, just know that it's not just purely based off of my love of the guy. It's also based off of what we saw in the California Classic. Now, of course, I was not here in Sacramento during the California Classic. It was very strange. I had like FOMO to an upteenth degree. To have games happening inside the Golden One Center and for me not to be there was very strange for me. I was on vacation. I was on a cruise ship. The good thing is this cruise ship had a sports bar. And in that sports bar, they had multiple televisions. And the majority of them were tuned to the California Classic so I got to watch Keegan Murray's two massive games uh, inside the Golden One Center. And I even had, uh, there were actually a decent amount of people from Sacramento that were on this cruise ship. It took a, took a sail out of L.A. And I converted another couple of people into at least being Keegan Murray fans or maybe secret under the table uh, Sacramento Kings fans. Had a lot of fun on the cruise ship watching Keegan Murray ball out. But I will tell you, I was very surprised when I saw that Keegan Murray was on the Kings Summer League roster. I didn't think there was any reason whatsoever for the Kings to, to play Keegan. I thought it was an unnecessary injury, uh, injury risk. I thought Keegan Murray more than proved himself as a starter in the NBA, more than proved himself uh, in his rookie season, especially with how he grew from the beginning of that playoff series against the Golden State Warriors to how he was playing at the end of that series. I didn't think him playing in Summer League was necessary compared to some of the other names from his draft class, like Jabari Smith Jr., for example. I think Jabari Smith Jr. just dropped 30 points, uh, 32 points or something like that in the Summer League in Las Vegas. Like, he needs that time. Keegan Murray doesn't really need that time. But I'm here to tell you that I'm wrong because I didn't think of the angle or I didn't think of the reasoning that was made very clear by the Sacramento Kings and by Keegan Murray in the mini training camp leading up to the California Classic and in the Cali Classic games themselves. Now, I'm very glad that Keegan Murray is not participating in Las Vegas Summer League. Again, there's no need to. What we saw in the two games in the California Classic is enough, and I'm going to get into those two games in just a second and his outstanding numbers uh, from both of those games. But to see what he was able to do, to see how he was able to emerge as the primary scorer, very different from how he performed as a rookie in the California Classic in Golden State or in, in San Francisco and in Las Vegas Summer League, even though he had that massive three-pointer, remember, uh, in the uh, Vegas Summer League opener against Paolo Bancaro and how amazing that moment was for him. He was great in that Summer League as well, but he was definitely the guy on that summer league team, but he didn't always play like it, right? He kind of fit into the flow of the offense, very similar to how he's performed uh, with the actual Sacramento Kings roster and how he performed last season. He was more of a fit than a kind of go-to guy. And there were times, if you remember, uh, and this was a common maybe complaint on King's social media uh, pages that we wanted to see Keegan try and take over more, be even more aggressive as a rookie in summer league. Well, we got that side of Keegan Murray in Summer League or in the California Classic this year. And I think that was the whole reason for why Keegan played. 
It was to get the opportunity to show how he could perform as the primary go-to scorer, which is something that the Sacramento Kings, to some extent, are lacking. We all know De'Aaron Fox is the guy, right? The Kings are going to go to De'Aaron Fox almost every single time when they need a big bucket. We know he's fourth quarter Fox, clutch player of the year. Like, we know De'Aaron Fox is absolutely the guy, but it helps to have more than one go-to score. Some would say, hey, DeMontis Sabonis is also that guy. In a lot of situations, I would agree with you. I still think DeMontis Sabonis is the second go-to option when the Kings need a bucket behind De'Aaron Fox. But the Kings don't have and did not have a third go-to scoring option. I mean, Kevin Herter was a really good scoring option for the Kings during the regular season, but so much of his offense depends upon the offense that the Sacramento Kings are running. Dribble handoffs, running off of screens. He isn't one to create his own shot. Same thing with Harrison Barnes. Harrison sometimes can create his own shot. We saw him do that a lot, not really last season, but the season before. Harrison, when he needed to get a bucket, Harrison would usually go to work in the post. The Kings have not had, or last, last season, despite how good their offense was because they ran it as a group, they lacked another guy that they could just give the ball to either late in the shot clock or when defenses are hounding De'Aaron Fox or hounding DeMontis Sabonis or one or not, or maybe both of those players are out of the game. The Kings lacked a guy that they could go to to really facilitate and carry that offense, and that is essential to success in the playoffs. We saw them lacking that go-to score in the playoffs significantly in multiple different uh, occasions during that uh, playoff series with the Golden State Warriors. So we got to see how Keegan Murray would perform as the go-to score, the leader, the guy on that California Classic Sacramento Kings roster, and what did he do? He turned in a 29-point performance followed by a 41-point performance. Let's break down some of the numbers from these two games. 29 points on 8 of 17 shooting from the field, 3 of 9 from 3-point range, 10 of 11 from the free throw line in Game 1 of the California Classic versus the Golden State Warriors. Then there's Game 2, which is the game that more people want to talk about, of course, because when you put up 41 points, people are going to take notice. 41 points on a super efficient 11 of 20 shooting from the field, 6 of 11 from three-point range. We all know how good of a shooter Keegan Murray is, the NBA record holder for most three-pointers made as a rookie in NBA history. 13 of 15 from the free throw line. He also had four blocks in that game, which is just, just a fun little extra defensive stat to add, which always works in his favor. But look, out of all these numbers, I think the 29 points and the 41 points are what people are going to gravitate towards. They're going to jump towards. This is the best part, right? This is showing that Keegan Murray can be that guy. To me, the best numbers in these two games are 10 of 11 from the free throw line and 13 of 15 from the free throw line. If you want to put an asterisk next to these numbers and say, Matt, it's a California Classic game. It's against California Classic competition. Keegan Murray, if he's as good as we think he is, he should dominate in that competition. Maybe you're right. He still did it. And the fact that he got to the free throw line 26 times in two games when he struggled to get to the free throw line, period, as a rookie. That wasn't really part of his game. In fact, there were times when Mike Brown was saying, attack be more aggressive. Don't go up so soft. Try and dunk on somebody. Get to the foul line. Play harder. Play with more physicality. He was asking multiple players to do that, not just Keegan Murray, but Keegan was one of the main guys that Mike was asking that from. Here Keegan Murray is going to the free throw line 26 times in two games and knocking down 23 of those free throws. I'm telling you, if Keegan Murray can consistently get to the foul line next season for the Sacramento Kings, we are going to have a lot more 29, 30-point games for Mr. Murray. We know how good he is on the perimeter. We know how good he can be putting the ball on the floor and creating his own shot. He showed that a lot in this California Classic as well. But his ability to attack the basket, finish around the rim, and specifically get to the foul line where he's a very good free throw shooter, that unlocks a whole nother level of Keegan Murray's game. We need to see him do this consistently, of course, against true NBA rosters. I'm not expecting Keegan Murray to come out and drop 29 points and 41 points in the first two games of the regular season. Although if he does that, then of course we're all going crazy here in Sacramento, right? I'm not saying that I expect Keegan Murray to be a 29 point per game score or even a 25 point per game score. He scored 12 points per game or averaged 12 points per game for the Kings last season. I'm not expecting a colossal monumental leap to threaten De'Aaron Fox as the leading scorer of the Kings. Let's not go that extreme. But to think that 
Harrison or uh, Keegan Murray could replace Harrison Barnes as a 15 point per game score. Go even higher, go even beyond that. And let's just not project to next season. Let's project going forward. The Kings, and I've shared this with you, the Kings view Keegan Murray as a future all-star. They believe Keegan is going to be an all-star. They believe he is going to be the third piece of a big three in Sacramento that can help them win championships. They believe that Keegan Murray, this game, this side of Keegan Murray's game that he showed in the California Classic, he can be that in the NBA. There can be nights where the Kings can rely on a 41-point performance or a 29-point performance from Keegan to help them get over the hump. And if truly you want to chalk up the last season or chalk up last season to injury luck and say, man, the Kings are going to be lucky if they can stay as healthy as they did last season. Truly, if you wonder if De'Aaron Fox is going to be able to play as much as he played or DeMontis Sabonis is going to be able to play out as much as he played. If Keegan Murray can step up and be that guy to where in the nights where Fox and Sabonis or Fox or Sabonis are out, Keegan can step up and take on a bulk of that scoring. The Kings are in really good position. I think Keegan is more than capable of being that guy. He still has a ways to go. But like I said, Keegan averaged 12.2 points per game last season. That was behind De'Aaron Fox, of course, DeMontis Sabonis, Kevin Herter, Harrison Barnes, and Malik Monk. Five guys on this roster averaged more than Keegan did per game. I'm going to predict it right now. I think Keegan Murray is going to be the third leading scorer in terms of points per game average for the Sacramento Kings next season. It's not hard to imagine him surpassing Monk. It's not hard to imagine him surpassing Harrison Barnes. It's not hard to imagine surpassing Kevin Herter. Now, here's the question that I have. We talked a lot about Harrison Barnes and wanting to improve upon Harrison Barnes. Harrison Barnes was at best the fourth leading uh or the fourth scoring option for the Kings. The numbers reflect that. He finished like 0.2 points per game behind Harrison or uh, Kevin Herter. So it's not like Herter was drastically better than him as the third scoring option. And again, remember, we're talking about one of the best offenses we've ever seen statistically in the NBA. So the Kings aren't reinventing the wheel here and they don't have to have drastic change. But if uh, Keegan Murray were to replace Harrison Barnes, in terms of points per game, let's say they swapped. Harrison drops down to 12. Keegan steps up to around 15 points per game or at that 15 point per game mark. Are the Sacramento Kings a better team, the same team, or a worse team? I think that's a fun conversation to have, and I want to hear your thoughts on that uh, in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening, of course, you can reach me on Twitter at MattGeorgeSack. Email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Anytime Keegan Murray is scoring more, I think it makes the Sacramento Kings a better basketball game a better basketball team, period, because I think Keegan Murray is far more capable of being a go-to, reliable, get-a-bucket-for-the-king score than both Harrison Barnes and Kevin Herter. Now, I'm not saying that the Kings want Keegan to jump into 16, 17-point-per-game land and have Harrison and uh, Kevin Herter fall off a cliff, especially Kevin Herter, right? When, when the Kings acquired Herter, one of the major conversation points was can Herter uh, adjust or embrace a bigger offensive role, more shots, more shot attempts than he ever had in his time in Atlanta. I think last season, at least during the regular season, he showed that he can be that guy. But maybe as he showed in the postseason, the Kings can't necessarily rely on him to be a go-to scorer to get them big buckets in the course of a playoff series when they need it. Keegan Murray, I think, can be that guy. So if the Kings run the same, same starting five out there, and I believe they're going to. Let's say that starting five lasts the entire regular season. If the Kings are giving you a starting five that are all averaging double digits points per game and it goes Fox in the 20s, DeMontis Sabonis just below the 20s, although I still think De'Aaron Fox, by the way, can take a leap into the mid to high 20s. Well, he's already in the mid 20s, into the high 20s to maybe flirting with 30 points per game. Fox and Sabonis is the top two guys. Then Keegan at 15, 16, 17 points per game. Herter are still around 15, 14. Harrison Barnes around 11 or 12. The Kings offensively are in a really, really good uh, good spot. And specifically for winning big games and for playoff basketball, they have a guy in Murray that they can rely heavier on and go to. And we even saw elements of that when the Kings were playing the Golden State Warriors in this playoff series, how great, great he was from, was it game three? No, it was game four. 
From game four onward, Keegan Murray looked like a completely different person, and the Kings were relying heavily upon him. If Keegan can be that type of guy in the playoffs and over the course of the regular season, I'm telling you, the Kings are in really good shape. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Keegan Murray looks so much better as a, a primary go-to scorer. And as he said, he's been spending the majority, if not all of his time this offseason, working with De'Aaron Fox. I've talked about different elements of De'Aaron Fox's leadership, right? He's not necessarily a scream, get in your face type leader, but he's a leader by example. He's grown as a leader in that locker room, grown as a leader in the huddle. And here he is working with the Kings rookie going into a sophomore season, working with him every day. And the first glimpse of results we see, even if it's against lesser competition, we see a player in Keegan Murray that dominated, was the best player, not just in the California Classic. I would argue that if Keegan Murray were playing in the, uh, in the Las Vegas Summer League, he would rival Victor Wenbenyama for the best player on the court, period. Now, I'm not saying he's going to have a better career than Victor Wenbenyama. Hit that, hear that very closely. I'm saying Keegan, at this point, looked like, in terms of summer league competition, nobody could touch him. That's great to see out of someone who the Kings are hoping can go become a go-to scorer and future All-Star. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Ibotta. Are you picking up burgers and hot dogs for a summer barbecue? We're all already doing it, so why not earn cash back while doing it? By using Ibotta, it gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care and everything in between. You can make sure you're beating inflation by getting cash back on all of your purchases. All you do is download the Ibotta app. You start earning cash back on your purchases right away. The average Ibotta user earns $120 per year. That could cover the entire cost of a grocery ship or, uh, a trip or maybe help you save towards a big purchase, a vacation, whatever it may be. Other apps give you points that you can use towards buying certain products and using at different stores. Ibotta just gives you straight cash to use wherever you want. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKED when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Ibotta app, and use code LOCKED. That's I-B-O-T-T-A and the Google Play or App Store and use our code LOCKED. We spent a lot of time talking about Keegan Murray. Let's really quickly talk about Chris Murray. Why, Matt? He's a Portland Trailblazer. The, the Trailblazers drafted him one spot before the Sacramento Kings on draft night. You're right. That did happen. But if Chris Murray had made it past the Portland Trailblazers, if Chris Murray were there one pick later, would the Sacramento Kings have drafted him instead of making the trade they made with the Dallas Mavericks to open up cap space? Well, according to Brian Windhurst, who appeared on J.J. Reddick's podcast, The Old Man of the Three, Brian is reporting that the Sacramento Kings were planning on drafting Chris Murray and pairing him with his twin brother, Keegan, here in Sacramento. When the, tra when the Trailblazers decided to pick before to take Chris, that's when the Sacramento Kings pivoted and ultimately made that trade with the Dallas Mavericks. Preference-wise, would I rather have Chris Murray or that Dallas Mavericks trade? Of course, hindsight is a lot easier now that we know some of the results of the trade, but the Kings have used the money that they opened up, used, I should say, some of the money that they opened up in that deal by trading away Rashawn Holmes and essentially Omax Prosper to the Dallas Mavericks. They've used some of that money to bring back Harrison Barnes, to bring back Trey Lyles, to play uh, or pay uh, Sasha Vizenkov, to pay Alex Len, and to extend the contract of DeMontis Sabonis. So you tell me, I have the chance to go back in time. I can do it all over again. Chris Murray is there. I can either pick the trade, knowing the result, or take Chris Murray and hope that the Kings still have enough money to make all these moves that they've made. I'm picking the trade. Even though I love Chris Murray and it would have been so much fun to have the Murray twins here in Sacramento, I'm taking the trade. But what I want to talk about with this is, is simply, if this is true, and I think there's a very solid there's a very good chance that this is true because I don't necessarily think that the Sacramento Kings planned going into draft night that their number one option was going to be to trade the pick away 
along with Rashawn Holmes to open up cap space. Also, timing is incredibly important. Now, while it's rare to find teams making deals with other teams when it's well before their time making a selection, let's just say it, it feeds into this narrative or feeds into this rumor that the Kings wanted Chris Murray and then had to pivot in another direction based off of the fact that after Chris was taking the pick before them while they were on the clock, they got this deal done. I cannot confirm or deny either side. All I can do is speculate, and all I can do is talk about what did happen. And if truly the Sacramento Kings were forced to pivot, Chris Murray was the plan, and it got pulled out from underneath them right before they were on the clock, then I applaud Monty McNair, and I applaud the Sacramento Kings front office for finding not just a pivot, finding a pivot that I just said I would choose over the original plan. To find a team that was willing to take on Rashawn Holmes' money, to open up cap flexibility, which is something that Monty McNair has talked a lot about over his entire time here in Sacramento, to be able to still stick to your plan or accomplish your goal while making a on-the-fly change or on-the-fly decision with the player that you want to be and taking the pick before you, I think that's significant. So I don't know if this counts as a mythical star on the uh, report card or resume of Monty McNair. I think this further feeds into, regardless of if they wanted Chris or didn't want Chris, they still made a great move on draft night, and it further feeds into whether you believe in Monty McNair or not, which you all know I do, and I think you absolutely should. I think he's earned that. Monty McNair and his front office have clearly proven to be very savvy, very aware, and capable of pivoting in different directions. They're not going to fully commit to one idea and keep all ideas uh, out of the back of their heads and not even worry about those ideas. They're not tunnel vision, right? And I think the Kings also proved that with how they handled the Harrison Barnes negotiations, talking to other players, being interested in other players, still having conversations with Harrison Barnes, and then ultimately deciding that Harrison, for the money that they paid him, was the best option. The Kings have a very smart and competent front office in place. And whether this Chris Murray rumor is true or not, I feel even more confident uh, about this front office going forward. The Sacramento Kings have two roster spots and one two-way contract remaining that they have to fill. Now, these roster spots might not be filled until after training camp. That decision might not be made until after training camp. I don't think we're done seeing Monty McNair's moves. I don't think we're going to see a big move by any means, but maybe a small move here or there to come in and, and fill some of those spots. Training camp invites things like that to see who makes the final roster and who doesn't. But a name who is playing and is suiting up for the Sacramento Kings right now in Las Vegas Summer League, I think deserves significant consideration. I'm talking about Jordan Ford from Folsom High School here just up the road in Sacramento, just up Highway 50. Jordan Ford spent all last season playing for the Stockton Kings, so he's familiar with the organization, not on a two-way contract, just on a contract playing for Stockton. Jordan Ford had a really, really good, or I should say solid season in the G League with Stockton. He comes into the California Classic, plays decent, comes into his first game of the uh, uh, of Las Vegas Summer League, drops a 20 bomb, and looks really, really good. And I put this out on social media. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it here at the end of the podcast. Why not give Jordan Ford a spot? Now, I think it's more likely that if Jordan's given a contract, it's the final two-way spot, and maybe that's the route that the Kings go, and that would be a great use of that new third two-way spot. The other two spots going to Jalen Slauson and to uh, Keon Ellis at this point in time. But the Kings still need a quote-unquote third point guard. Maybe they don't necessarily need it, but it makes sense for them to still add depth at that position. However, Whoever the Kings go out and get at that position, they know that they're going to be behind De'Aaron Fox, they're going to be behind Davion Mitchell, and they're going to be behind Malik Monk. So the Kings really already have their top three primary ball handlers on this roster right now. And I don't think there's going to be anybody that they're going to find that is going to take that position away. Unless there is a veteran like Matthew Della Vadova, who was at actually the, uh, or was with the Sacramento Kings, or some of the Kings players sitting courtside in Vegas watching Summer League, which I thought was pretty cool. He's going back to Australia to play professional basketball. At least those were the reports, and, and, and that was the news that broke earlier on this offseason. So I think Matthew Della Vadova's time with the Sacramento Kings is done. But 
If there is a veteran point guard that Mike Brown trusts that the Kings want to bring in to take that spot, by all means, go ahead and do that. But if there's not a veteran in place or a veteran name out there that, that Mike really wants or has a connection with or that would make sense for this Kings roster, why not give that third point guard spot to Jordan Ford, a local prospect playing for his hometown team. He's not going to get a whole lot of playing time. Again, there are already three guys on the depth chart that are above him, even though two of them, and Davion Mitchell and, and Malik Monk, are, I guess, more known as two. And Davion Mitchell's a one, but doesn't always play as a primary ball handler. Malik, Malik Monk is a two, but spent a lot of time last season for the Kings as a primary ball handler. Jordan Ford, or whichever point guard the Kings bring in, that player is going to be behind the three of them. So, I don't know if the Kings are going to give him a two-way contract spot. I think that's more likely than a straight-up roster spot, but I think Jordan Ford would be an excellent choice in that realm, would still spend a lot of time in Stockton with the, uh, with the Stockton Kings, but also could spend uh, some good time here practicing with the Sacramento Kings and maybe suiting up and playing at times for the Sacramento Kings. I don't think it would be a hindrance for Jordan Ford to get spot minutes at times when the Kings really needed him. But maybe we'll see more from this uh, this. Uh, summer league and see more from training camp. But I certainly wouldn't hate the idea of the whole hometown boy getting his first NBA contract here with the Sacramento Kings. So we'll see what they do with that. I want to hear your thoughts on Keegan Murray. I want to hear your thoughts on the Chris Murray rumors. Send them to me. Again, if you're uh, watching on YouTube, just leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below or video and audio listeners. You can find me on Twitter at Matt George Sack and you can email me Matt George Sports at gmail.com. Thank you so much, as always, for your support here of the Locked on Kings podcast. Tomorrow, I'm scheduled to have Brendan Nunez. You should know him. Uh, he is very uh, plugged in with the Sacramento Kings. Of course, he works for the Kings Herald. Uh, is featured on the Kings Beat, hosts the Kings Pulse podcast. He is also in Las Vegas right now covering uh, Kings basketball in, in Vegas. So we'll uh, get his thoughts on what he's seeing in person uh, in Las Vegas. We're also going to spend a lot of time talking about Sasha Vizenkov. And I'm going to share with you why I'm getting more and more excited about Sasha and his role with the Sacramento Kings and how he can help this Kings team win basketball games. That's all coming for you on tomorrow's episode of Locked on Kings. So I hope you'll join me for uh, that. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. <laughs>